Hello and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Brian Sebade and I work for the University of Wyoming Extension based in Laramie, Wyoming. Today we'll be talking about poisonous plants of high elevation irrigated pastures. What we're talking about with this are generally irrigation pastures that are over 6,500 feet in elevation. There's very little input or technology that's generally used besides flood irrigation. So we generally have some ditches. Uh, we can usually block those up, dam those up, um, and then end up getting water to where we need it. So this is a picture of a fairly stereotypical pasture that we'd be talking about. Uh, this one here is at about uh, 7,600 feet elevation. And what we're really talking about today are poisonous plants that we might find in these pastures or along the edges of these pastures that might be a concern for either grazing animals and livestock that we have or when we actually cut that hay and or that forage into hay and then end up selling it later. So why do we want to talk about this today? Why do we care? Um, obviously a loss of animals is not a good thing. That's a major economic impact to most of us and something we obviously try to avoid. Uh, we can also have a loss of genetics. This is something where maybe there's one or two animals that we're really trying to use to move along the genetics of our herd, and if we end up losing those, it can really set us back a long ways. We also need to think about when we have these poisonous plants, it can add to the logistics and management of the area. We might also have to think about there's some areas that we have to defer the grazing. We can't end up actually grazing it for that year and we need to try and control that problem plant or plants depending on how many might be there. Uh, we also might have a product that we can't sell so maybe we have hay with a bunch of um, poisonous plants in it as well which ends up being a major issue. Finally we need to just consider our emotional worry. If we have poisonous plants out there we don't want to have to be thinking about oh my gosh are my animals okay? What's going to happen uh, while they're out there? What if some get through a fence and then end up in an area they shouldn't be. So definitely something we want to try to avoid uh, for our irrigated pastures. Uh, so what we plan to cover today um, obviously will be very brief. Uh, you know if we want to go more in depth this would be a lot longer but we're only talking for about 15-20 minutes today. So we'll talk about identification of poisonous plants and their issues, uh, strategies for dealing with problem plants, and where to get help for unknown plants that you maybe have found but you're not sure what it is. One way to remember and separate out poisonous plants um, is by the mode by which they cause harm. So this might be more of a systematic approach so you can kind of block these into certain groups as to how they affect animals. That's effective for some folks. Um, obviously other folks can um, break those out into different uh, groups as well. Um, but we'll just kind of talk about that might be one, one method for you to, to move forward as you're trying to find poisonous plants on your property. Uh, some of the better known plants we're going to talk about today, obviously this is not every plant, just a few of those. Uh, this would inc include arrowgrass, poison water hemlock, showy milkweed, um, two species of death camas, hound's tongue, yellow sweet clover, and horsetail. Uh, proper identification is critical. Uh, if we don't properly identify what we have, we either are missing a plant that could be there and could be a problem, or we have a problem, or we have a plant that's not a problem and we don't really need to do anything about it. So identification is critical. Uh, we also need to understand what are the implications. Uh, some of these plants affect certain types of livestock. Um, some are more deadly than others, but really doing our research once we've properly identified these plants is really important. Uh, we also need to think about the health of our animals. Stressed animals are more likely to be poisoned. So do they have plenty of water? Have they been moved a lot? Um, are they really stressed out? Uh, what have we been doing for, um, you know, supplements? Are they having all the minerals that they need? Um, all those sorts of things are really important to make sure that we can avoid a poison. Um, we also need to think about some of the grazing strategies may need to change or some of the haying operation strategies may also need to change. So uh, we need to think about that as well as far as timing, what plants are there, how many plants are we going to allow in a certain area, those sorts of things. And then finally, we need to think about uh, not two management strategy, strategies are going to be the same. They'll all be a little bit different. 
All right, the first plant we're going to talk about is arrowgrass. Um, it's found growing near wet areas. Um, it's actually a forb and not a grass. Um, the effect from this is cyanide poisoning. So obviously something that's not very good at all. Um, has major detrimental effects on livestock. Uh, all ruminants are affected by this. Uh, it is a native grass, or excuse me, a native forb. Um, that is one of two plants um, found in the arrowgrass genus um, that we pointed out above in the slide. <clears throat> These plants, as we've talked about, prefer wet soils. Um, they're pretty low growing, so lots of times to actually find um, the flowering part of the plant, uh, that can be a little bit challenging uh, until later in the season. So earlier on, that can be um, a bit of a challenge to go through and figure out where those plants might be. Uh, we can also find these plants in areas with relatively poor soils or low fertility, uh, so we should keep that in mind as well. Obviously, they can be found in the middle of a pasture, but we may also find these out um, somewhere else uh, along the edge. Uh, as these plants become stressed, they also are suggested to become more toxic than healthy plants, as they tend to accumulate and concentrate some of those toxins a little bit more, so we need to think about that. Um, the toxin itself is not accumulative, uh, so we need to think about, this is not over time, but this would be, uh, you know, one livestock animal got out of the fence and ends up consuming a lot of this arrowgrass at one point, and that's where we end up with issues. Uh, so we just generally want to try and avoid them. Uh, for those looking to use a chemical control, metsulfuron is one of those options that we can try and use for controlling this plant. Okay, plants that cause sudden death continued. Uh, water hemlock is another native plant that we have. It's one of those that um, find, we find it in lots of wet areas and can actually be a really major issue, um, not only for livestock, but also for humans as well. Uh, we want to completely avoid haying or grazing areas with water hemlock. This stuff is bad news. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're definitely avoiding roots somehow getting brought up, put into hay, or we're touching those. Animals might come into contact because those are going to be some major issues for us as well. Uh, that's supposedly the most deadly part of the plant is where that accumulates most of that toxin, so we need to avoid that. Uh, definitely wanna survey areas ahead that you might be haying or grazing. Uh, we also want to remove water hemlock plants from um, the grazed areas by digging them up. Maybe we burn them. Uh, we can also use different types of broadleaf herbicides like 2,4-D. But again, if it's in water, that makes it a little bit more challenging for a herbicide control. Okay, uh, continued. Uh, we also have uh, poison hemlock, which is very similar, but it's actually introduced. Um, it's responsible for killing Socrates, if you're familiar with that. Um, found growing on drier sites than water hemlock, but still these are going to be wet soils that you're going to find it and not so much growing directly in water like we might find with water hemlock. Um, again, a little bit different uh, toxin than water hemlock, but still something that is very deadly uh, to us. Again, both these plants are in the carrot family, so we have you know, nice white flowers, uh, which is great. Um, but one way we can actually help separate these two is on the stem, we're gonna end up with dark purple, dark red, or kind of almost brownish uh, coloring spots that you can see here. So that's really good help for identification. Uh, here we can see right along the edge of a meadow, uh, some really nice lush vegetation. Um, we can see how it'd be pretty easy for some livestock to come through um, if they were being hurried, pressed along, uh, stressed out. Uh, to actually eat some of these leaves or part of these stems uh, as they're going through. So uh, we have more of a fern-like leaf with this plant, but again, uh, can get quite tall and would not be good to go through and cut this plant into some A if we didn't know what we were dealing with. All right, moving on, uh, we also have uh, showy milkweed. Most of us are probably fairly familiar. We can see this lots of times with uh, horse pastures where uh, horses might eat everything down and then leave these plants uh, behind. They are important to monarch butterflies, but unfortunately um, can definitely be a detriment to livestock. So we want to think about uh, trying to remove these if we can. 
Um, this, this plant disrupts the heart function, so obviously not a great thing. Um, some of the plants we can just pull uh, once we start to see them come up. We can also use herbicides uh, depending on where we're at. So um, again, most animals try to avoid it, but if we chop it up into hay or we just have some really stressed animals moving through, this might be an issue. Again, we have these big white or big wide flowers, ex excuse me. Uh, we have kind of the milky latex uh, liquid that comes out when we break those leaves. So generally that's not, um, you know, palatable to many of our grazing animals, but still one of those things that, uh, that can be an issue. Okay, cardiac effects continued. Uh, we have death camas species. There's meadow death camas, mountain death camas. Um, they're both native plants. We see them early in the spring. One thing we need to really watch out for with these plants is they're really hard on sheep. So if sheep come into contact or consume these plants, uh, we end up with some really bad issues. Um, alkaloids are the main issue that we're dealing with with these plants. Um, sometimes the problem with alkaloids are uh, livestock don't realize how much of those plants they've consumed, how much of that toxin, and then they end up consuming more before it's too late, and then we end up with major issues. Uh, so here's meadow death camas. Uh, we can see that's got a nice white flower, but early in the spring it mixes in really well um, with a lot of other grass species. So uh, we need to really watch this one. Uh, here we're kind of in more of an open forested area, um, but it's going to grow in the similar fashion as it would in an irrigated pasture. Uh, humans have run into issues with wild onions here on the right, uh, confusing it with the death camas, and they've also come into contact. Um, here's our mountain death camas. Again, one of those that uh, probably not as much in the meadow per se or an irrigated pasture as compared to the meadow death camas, but the mountain variety uh, can also be an issue as well. So you can see how some of the leaves uh, look very similar to that of grasses. Okay, so some of the the effects from this, um, all parts are poisonous and can cause cardiovascular failure. Um, it's one of those things where it gets grazed early in the spring and sometimes we don't catch it until it's too late. So um, it's just one of those we really need to go out and do the surveying ahead of time to make sure it's not there because it hides in really well. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about is hound's tongue. Uh, this is another one that's been introduced from Europe. Um, it's a biennial, so it puts out leaf material the first year, a rosette, and then it actually flowers the second year um, after it's overwintered. Um, it can cause photosensitization, and um, it's one of those that can end up leading to liver damage. Um, Again, hopefully I'm not being critiqued on my pronunciation, but uh, it's one of those that's not easy to pronounce. So uh, the main toxin, again, is an alkaloid, so another one of those issues. Um, personally, where I've seen the issues with this is uh, young calves actually grazing it when there hasn't been good range um, conditions. So that's something that they're trying to actually go out and eat. Uh, but one of those, if, again, if we cut it into hay or we've got animals out there grazing that have been um, stressed that we've just thrown out, um, we've trucked them a long way and just thrown them out into a pasture um, with these or, in a, or a meadow that's uh, got this plant in there, we can end up with some issues that way. Um, again, the young plants are the most poisonous, so um, those young leaves can be, can be a major issue. Um, <clears throat> Death can actually occur after the fact, so um, you know it's one of those things that builds up. So if we've had a lot of exposure over time, then we can end up with some issues. Um, here we have a young plant. Um, it was actually grazed um, by some young calves, um, you know, a few days before this picture was taken. But that's what we're actually looking for. It's not actual the entire plant that's been consumed, but one of those of just a few of those over time where it builds up. Um, you may also know it for these seeds that stick um, that you end up with in your shoes and other places like that. Okay, plants affecting the blood. Uh, yellow sweet clover is something uh, that we see all over the place. Um, for a lot of our high irrigation meadows, maybe it's not always quite as common, but we do tend to find it in quite a few of those places as well. Um, 
again, depending on where you're at, who defines it, um, it might be a perennial annual or biannual, depending on uh, the moisture that's receiving. But what we know is it's actually fairly good forage. Um, but what happens is it's actually mold that um, causes the toxicity issues with this plant. Um, so the amount of mold makes it very tough to determine how much of this plant it's going to take to actually cause a, an animal to die or a poisoning to happen. So again, nice bright yellow flowers. We've all probably seen this. Um, it can be all over depending on the year uh, when the climate and everything is right for it. Uh, but basically we end up with a similar issue to what happens with a lot of our rodenticides. Uh, we just turns into an anticoagulant. So this is not a good thing at all. Um, so this is, uh, can be pretty deadly. So if you have some of this in an irrigated meadow, we want to make sure that it gets dried out really fast um, and avoid getting that, um, you know, fungi that grows on there and actually ends up causing the issues. Okay, we also have horsetail. Uh, these are really old plants, um, similar to another um, uh, poisonous plant, uh, bracken fern. Um, again, I haven't included that plant because it's not always in irrigated meadows as much. Um, this really tends to affect horses. So, um, you know, if you've got horses that are grazing an area early in the spring, um, you're cutting a bunch up, throwing hay that's going to be used as horse hay. Uh, we really need to be careful of that. Um, ends up causing a thiamine deficiency. Um, and from personal experience, I've known several cases where this has happened and um, you don't always catch it right away and just definitely not a good deal for uh, any equine that eat it. So again, it's native. Uh, it's probably fairly familiar to most of us, but um, we'll see it along stream banks and other places like that. Um, but we, if we have a wet area in those meadows, um, it definitely tends to pop up. Okay, lastly, um, that was kind of a quick overview of a few plants that we have out there, um, but there's lots of other information that's available. So your local UW Extension Office will have information for you. Um, county Weed and Pest Offices are always available. They can help out. Um, and then our conservation districts that are, are, are all around. Um, as far as identification goes and where you might be finding these plants, the Rocky Mountain Herbarium is great. Um, it has online resources now where you can actually look up plants and then you can do some comparison to try and see if that's maybe what you have on your property. Um, another one that's great that talks more about management, what to look for, um, what the effects of these plants are exactly, um, how much of it is going to affect animals before you end up with some major issues or death. Um, I will recommend that you check out USDA Bulletin 415. It's really great. Um, it's all online now as well. So if you don't want to have to print off the bulletin, you can go through and they've got it all there as well. So that's really nice. And then finally, the last uh, bit of information we have um, for you today is the uh, plants poisonous to livestock in Wyoming and Montana. This is new, um, but goes through and gives some really good information of, of what plants are there, and then also thinking about the management, uh, how exactly those um, toxins are affecting animals, um, and really goes more in depth, which is also really great. So um, either one of these um, I would highly recommend. And yeah, from there, we appreciate you listening today. And uh, hopefully you now have a little bit more information on how to avoid these plants and what to do if you maybe come into contact with them. Thank you.